My bits are minimally edited videos that, for one reason or another, wouldn't work in my normal format. This one's on all the other Prion stuff that didn't quite make the cut in the story that I wanted to tell. The first topic to geek out about is this protein doppel. Assuming you've watched my Prion video, which if you haven't, go do that, it's great, you'd know that doppel is a gene protein that was discovered by accident while scientists were researching the Prion protein. Doppel is named as such due to being the Prion's doppelganger. It's very nearby the prion gene, and the protein sequence is also extremely similar. But doppel isn't as associated with neurodegenerative diseases like prion protein is. So naturally, all the questions we asked about the prion protein in that video can be asked about doppel. What does doppel do? Why do we need doppel? Why do we make doppel? This part is really cool. Learning about doppel was actually my favorite part of the video, and I'm just excited to share. While the prion protein was discovered to play some kind of role in neurobiology, doppel is actually important for a completely different cell type. You, right now, listening to this video, take a guess at what human cell type doppel plays an important role in. Maybe something brain-related, like a microglia perhaps, the resident immune cell of the brain. Or maybe they're oligodendrocytes or astrocytes, supporting nervous system cells that help out neurons. No. Doppel has been discovered to play a role in sperm. Mice that have had their doppel gene knocked out were infertile. When the sperm of these mice were examined, the actual cellular structure of the sperm were disrupted. Not only were the heads of these sperm malformed, the flagella, the motor that propels the sperm towards the egg, were bent. These sperm were found unable to penetrate the eggs, but interestingly, if the egg was pre-cut already, the sperm were able to successfully fertilize and create a viable embryo. This indicates that the doppel protein is important for the correct formation of gametes. Despite being extremely similar, the prion and the doppel gene evolved to do completely different things. Doppel is highly expressed in the testes, but as you know from the prion video, it can be expressed in the brain too. In the original prion video, manipulations of the prion gene accidentally caused doppel to be expressed in the brain. In the wild type, unmanipulated mouse, doppel is expressed at low levels in the brain. So what's it doing up there? I couldn't find much for the little googling I did, but one interesting bit I did learn was that doppel and prion may be antagonistic towards one another. So the visual gag of doppel being prion's shadow clone might not even be a gag. The Nagasaki mice mentioned in the first prion video had the prion gene knocked out. But the way that the Nagasaki mice were engineered meant that the doppel protein was actually being made at a much higher than normal rate, causing neurotoxicity. Interestingly, when you add the prion gene back into the Nagasaki mice, the treated Nagasaki mice no longer experienced neurodegeneration. Think about that for a second. The regular Nagasaki mice had cerebellar Purkinje cell loss because too much doppel was being made. But once you get the Nagasaki mice to express prion again, no more toxicity. Meaning there is an antagonistic relationship between prion and doppel where doppel only causes neuron cell death when prion is not around. And that's freaking wild. Before I move on to the next question, I'd like to take a second to just plug the idea of subscribing to my channel if you like Biology Deep Dives. And if you want to take the extra step to monetarily support me, I've got YouTube membership too. Just saying. The next question I wanted to cover was the mystery of why different prion diseases exist when the cause of the diseases remains the same. While it's easy to point out that different prion diseases are associated with different alterations of the prion protein, it's not as easy to answer why those specific alterations cause different symptoms. We know that Kuru is marked by damage to the cerebellum, the cortex of the brain responsible for movement. Fatal familial insomnia causes damage to the thalamus, the relay center of the brain that also regulates sleep. CJD is characterized by damage to the cerebrum, the cortex responsible for cognition and higher level thought. But how does a 1 to 2 change in amino acid sequence cause damage to different parts of the brain? This question is really hard to find the answer to. As a reminder, I am not a prion expert, so my lack of an answer here could just be due to my Google Scholar skill issue. But I figure this is also a pretty good point to pause and give us all a chance to generate a hypothesis to this very interesting question. I have a couple of hypotheses in mind for how this could work, and I'd like to compare my notes to yours as a fun exercise. For this thought experiment, let's confine our thoughts to just fatal familial insomnia, a heritable prion disease marked by two changes to DNA that results in the change of two amino acids in the prion protein. Pause the video now or watch the upcoming ad and give it some thought. Ready to share? Okay, here we go. The central dogma of biology states that we go from DNA to mRNA to protein. We also know that in people with FFI, they have changes at the DNA level which translates to a difference in the protein. Compared to wild-type prion, the FFI prion accumulates in the thalamus. How do proteins know where to be made? 
Whether or not a gene is made into protein is controlled by genetic regulatory elements, the most well known being promoters. Promoters are DNA sequences that live upstream of the gene that they regulate and are structured in a way that allows proteins, called transcription factors, to recruit the enzyme RNA polymerase to begin the process of turning DNA into RNA into then protein. Different cell types express different transcription factors. It's how they know what cell to be. If this feels like a chicken and egg type problem, it is. So stay tuned for the eventual developmental biology stream to disentangle that problem. But back to prions. A change in the protein coding region of DNA should not change, as far as I know, the pattern of mRNA expression in the brain. Since the mutation isn't in the regulatory element, that is likely not the reason why we have different areas of damage in different prion diseases. So it's likely not a DNA or RNA issue. What about the protein? Since FFI is genetic, and since all of your somatic cells share the same genetic code, the code for the mutated prion protein should be the same in all your neurons. So why does the mutated prion protein mostly only damage the thalamus? My hypothesis is that the unique environment of the thalamic neurons may be in one way or another encouraging the formation of these specific prion aggregates. That's a very vague model, so let's try to make guesses at specifics. One possible route by which the FFI prion can be selectively damaging the thalamus is through selective upregulation of the prion protein. Maybe this specific prion increases the production of its own transcription factor, but needs some thalamus-specific protein or genetic pathway to do so. Another hypothesis is that the FFI prion protein may have an easier time aggregating because it's being helped by some thalamus-specific protein. Maybe thalamic neurons make some kind of protein that acts as a good nucleator for aggregates to form. You should be familiar with nucleation if you've made a crystal of any kind. Nucleation just refers to a starting point where crystals, or in our case, prion aggregates, can start forming. These are the two hypotheses I came up with. And so, how might you test these? Again, pause the video now if you want to work out your science brain. One possible way I could imagine at least ruling out the first possibility is to take mice with induced FFI and see whether or not the prion mRNA is upregulated in the thalamus. It seems like it should, but maybe damage in the thalamus isn't due to more prion protein being made, but rather more prion protein being able to be aggregated. Not to toot my own horn, but this kind of experiment would be really good to do, as no matter what the answer is, you still learn something about prion diseases either way. Before I get to the final thing I want to talk about, I want to re-emphasize, I am not a doctor or a prion expert. The ultimate authority on actionable information regarding your personal health is a combination of the scientific establishment and your doctors. Spontaneous prion diseases are rare. Transmissible prion diseases are also very rare. Those are the facts. I am not at liberty to discuss whether or not you should be worried about them because, again, not a doctor or health science professional. But I did see a bit of worrying information recently about the potential transmission of prion diseases from deer to humans. Chronic wasting disease is a prion disease in deer that can remain infectious in the soil. It is not believed that deer can transmit prion diseases to humans, although a paper in 2019 suggests that it could be possible. As a precaution, the CDC warns hunters of deer to avoid eating parts of the deer that are known to harbor the prion protein. But in 2022, two hunters in the same group came down with CJD at roughly the same time. They had been known to eat deer from the same population. At first, when I read this, I honestly kind of freaked out. CWD prions have been shown to be stable in the environment, and this new information kind of hints at an apocalyptic exponential growth of prions in our food chain as being a possible future. But then I read the paper that speculated on a CWD deer to CJD human transmission event, and uh, I honestly don't understand it. This is my true and honest call to prion scientists to help me communicate whether this should be a concern. Both the hunters that came down with CJD tested positive for a homozygous mutation in their prion protein position 129 meaning the cause of the hunter's disease was genetic. This is in contrast to mad cow disease, where humans were getting variant CJD from our prions aggregating with cow prions. I don't see how consuming deer prion can cause a mutation in the genome other than random chance. Because to me, there are two possibilities. Either these two hunters, who by the way were of old age, both happened to come down with CJD dementia coincidentally. Or, the deer prion protein, despite being absolutely tiny with no enzymatic catalytic activity known, can somehow recognize the human version of its DNA sequence and also induce a mutation in the exact spot needed to develop prion disease. Kind of like CRISPR, but somehow doing it without a guide RNA. I'd bet on number one unless anybody can show me a compelling reason how a small protein like the prion protein can specifically modify the genome without some mechanism of sequence specificity. To explain why I find number two to be quite unlikely, let's list out the properties that the prion protein would have to exhibit to modify the genome. 
the prion protein would have to have some kind of editing mechanism or activate an editing mechanism in mammals. The prion protein would have to have some kind of way to specify a precise mutation site within the DNA. The prion protein doesn't appear to have enzymatic activity on its own, nothing that really looks like domains that could catalyze reactions with DNA. The prion protein also lacks a nuclear localization signal, meaning that it is unlikely that you find the prion protein in the nucleus. And, if the prion protein acts indirectly on the DNA through a different editing mechanism, what mechanism? As far as I know, mammals like us don't have pinpoint precise gene editing capability other than DNA repair. But, okay, let's say through the veil of diminishing improbability that the prion protein activates something that can edit the prion gene. The prion protein would still have to have some sort of mechanism to guide this cryptic undiscovered editing system to the prion gene. In CRISPR, which by the way comes from bacteria, this is usually achieved by a guide RNA that can bind the DNA of interest. The prion protein has no such capability on its own. All this to say is that I am really, really confused as to how eating deer with a prion disease could have possibly led to these hunters developing spontaneous genetic mutations resulting in their own prion diseases. This is a load of barnacles. Even if this case study seems weird to me, I'd still take the CDC's advice of not eating prion harboring organs of the deer. And that's it for this 5-bit. If you were disappointed that I didn't get to a discussion of tau and amyloid beta, don't be. They're on the list of topics too, so subscribe to not miss out on the fascinating world of cell and molecular biology. Not only do I do long form videos, but I also walk through real open access science papers with my audience to help practice our critical thinking and analytic skills, and that's been a lot of fun. Goodbye!